today I wanted to kind of go over a real life example where we've got an aircraft that we're trying to track some flight hours on. We've got different serial numbers of, of wings that are on it at say an induction and then a departure. And then we're trying to track these serialized components as well. So uh, we've got two trainable types, the aircraft configuration and then the wing or the serialized component configuration. I'd like to kind of fill these out and then talk with you about what would make sense as far as these fields, what would make sense as far as which fields are linking to each other. Okay. For creating a new trendable type, we generally, what I generally recommend is kind of thinking through at least some of the fields before you get started in inline. So that'll make it a little bit faster. I've got the serialized component. It could be several things. Maybe the serialized component could track wings and radomes. It's just, I'm trying to keep track of what are the different um, part numbers and, and serial numbers uh, of my inventory that I've got floating around. For the part number, I would probably create a list with a format rule. For the rev letter, I also probably want a list uh, with a format rule, just alphabetical characters from A to Z. Serial number, probably similar thing. I want a list with a rule or just a straight up list. If there's specific technical orders that have been applied to this part number, then that's probably from a drop down list, a date it was manufactured. A flight hour calculation would probably be a calculated field that I would not set up in the trendable type. I would set that up inside of a data set. So that'll kind of be another class. Today, I'd like to focus more on how to actually set up these links between the parent and the child, as well as walking through actual example. So we've got a part number that we want to record for the serialized component. Okay, so we've got a part number list that's already been created. Looks like I'm allowing users to add items to this list, but I do not have a formatting pattern. So you can see I've got all kinds of crazy data in here. I've got someone just put in forward fuselage instead of an actual part number. I've got inner wing, we've got mid fuselage. I've got nacelle number two. We've got all these different, different data in here. As you can imagine, that might make it pretty messy filter on a specific part number. Last week, we talked a little bit about formatting patterns, but there, to create a formatting pattern for this part number list, I click on this pencil icon here. And if I know that the part numbers always start with, I don't know, say PN, I could type that in. That would be a static text. Or I could say dynamic text and say, I want some digits. And I want a minimum of two and a maximum of two. So that basically just says, I want two digits at the start of my part number. And then after my two digits, let's say I want an uppercase letter. Or if I know that the letter needs to be an A for all my part numbers, I could just type in static text and then type it A in here. But for now, I'm gonna make it dynamic and just say uppercase letter and there's only one character. So I set my min and my max to one. And then after that, I know that there's a dash and that's static. It shouldn't be anything other than that dash. And after the dash, again, we're gonna have some digits with four characters. And I can, I, I always recommend, especially as you start with the list formatting to test your formatting rules, just to make sure that uh, it is going to do what you think it's going to do. The test this, it says it's invalid, right? Because I'm going up to five characters here and it only allows for four. So there's this default hint that is generated, but you can also create your own custom hint. So I could say numbers, letter, dash, and four numbers. I could create a custom hint like that that's kind of spelled out for them. And I could make this be anything I want. If I test this, it's valid, right? So I could have one, two, B, dash, one, two, three, four. save, it says, hey, we found a whole bunch of entries in this list 
that do not conform to your list formatting rules. So it basically alerts me saying, hey, we've detected a whole bunch of entries in this list that don't conform to the rule that you just created. Are you sure you want to save this? I'm gonna go ahead and hit yes. Basically what this is saying is someone could still select forward fuselage as an option from this dropdown list. And remember that I am allowing users to add items to this list as well. So I've got all these old entries. So if I'm working with an older database that already has some trendables, some records created, I'll probably want to go through and look and see where these are located and tr maybe try and clean up my database. But anything new will either have to conform to this rule or be one of these strange entries that I have. Okay, so there's my part number. So I'd like to add a revision letter as well, and I want that to be a drop-down list. That way they can't put the number three if it's supposed to be just rev A, rev B, rev C. This would be a great example of doing an import for a list or just setting a formatting pattern. I'm just going to put revision here, and then for the formatting pattern, instead of doing an import, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say only allow them to do an uppercase letter with the minimum of one and the maximum of two letters. You know, hopefully engineering doesn't go up to all the way through Z and then to A, A, revs, but I have seen it occasionally happen. So I could do something like that just in case there's an A, B, rev. I'm just going to add something here so you can see what it looks like, right? But I'm also allowing users to add to this list. So I don't have to import the entire alphabet into here. I can allow users to populate this list for me. And because I've got this formatting rule set in place, the, the highest they'll be able to go up to is something like ZZ. So ZZ is valid. Try ABC, however, because I limited it to two characters, that would be invalid. So now I've got the revision field. Um, serial number, similar thing. I probably want some type of a list with a formatting rule. So maybe all my serial numbers start with SN. And then after that, it's a dash. And after that, it's some sequence of digits. So maybe there's some technical orders that I want to know if some technical orders have been applied to this. Then I would leave this unchecked and then add all my technical orders. And potentially I've got a list somewhere that I could do an import on. That import is just this icon here. And I would then just navigate to my CSV file that has a, you know, a single column with all my technical orders. I just import that and then it would pre-populate these results here instead of me having to type them in one by one. Okay. And then date manufactured would be a field that's not a list. Flat error calculations calculated. Okay, so the next thing we come to is the fields. Now remember, just because I've created these lists doesn't mean they're a field yet. So when I come to add a field and I go to my list fields, I need to make sure that I point to any of these lists that I've created that haven't yet been added as a field. So revision is one that didn't exist before. And here we can allow them to multi-select, but for this, I just want one single rev letter. I want a date field. And this is date manufactured.
I've already got serial number in here. I've already got a part number in here. Technical order. We don't have technical order in here yet. So get the list field. These are technical orders. And that's it. So we've got these six different types of fields, right? We've got the date field. This link field is, you can think of it more as a URL field. It allows users to point to a specific URL. If there's some type of other data tracking system or engineering system or database that you'd like to point to that has a URL, you can add that link into these records via the link field or the URL field. So this link field is different than the linked trendable type fields, which I'll show you in a little bit here. Uh, the text field, remember the text field is the most free form and the most dangerous as far as quality of the data goes, but it also allows the most input. You can you know, write a paragraph in there if you want. The user field is just whoever is currently logged on to the system. And then the numeric field. On the numeric field, I can control how many decimal digits it has. So I could say, okay, the number that I want for this is going to be measured length of the part. And then I can change this to however many digits I want. I think it's, I think the limit is, is the highest it'll go. So maybe I just want one since it's, so these are not significant digits. These are just decimal digits. How many, in other words, how many digits following the decimal point, right? So I've got measured length in here now. Now I can go to the trendable type configuration and create my new trendable type of a serialized component. Give it a nice description. Here is where I start adding in these fields. The majority of these fields are going to be standard fields. So I want the part number. If I, type, if I start typing into the search bar up here, it will limit, it will start filtering down the different fields that I've created. Remember, the order in which I add the fields in here are the order in which they're going to appear as people are doing the data entry. So I put re the revision letter next to the part number because that kind of made sense in my head because these two pieces of information kind of go next to each other. And then the serial number. And any technical orders. And the manufacturer date. And the measured length of the part. Okay. So in this column, it shows the field types. These are all lists. And remember, list is one of the most powerful fields that you can have because you can limit, uh, you can add these formatting rules to them. And we've got a date manufactured and a measured length. Let me go ahead and add in a description. And you'll see here, this field type is a text field. So none of these are required. So we'd like to make, at the very least, if I double click on the require on this field, it'll bring up some different options. And so I'd like to click the checks box that's required. And then maybe I can add some help text. Look under the part for the stamped part number. I'd also like to make the serial number required. And then I can go through my data and, and just think through, you know, what are the pieces of information that I must have in order for this database to be um, quality and legitimate? So I'm go, going to go ahead and save this now and then create um, 
the fields for my aircraft turnable type. So I believe I already have a tail number field. But I do not have the serial number at induction and serial number at departure. So I go to my turnable type configuration. Oops. And I go to add one. Aircraft configuration. Add the tail number. Uh, the actual flight hours. And so here's where the linked and the copied fields are going to come in. I would like to link to the trendable type that is the serialized component. And then this will give me a list of all the different fields that the serialized component has. So I would like to pull in the serial number from the serialized component. So I could also pull in any other field from that serialized component that I haven't yet highlighted. So if I wanted in the aircraft configuration field to see the part number and the revision and the other fields like that, I could see any field that I've already filled out for the serialized component and add this to the aircraft configuration trendable type. So if I look in this connection column, it'll, it will say link, and that will give me an indication that these are the fields that are linked to another trendable type, the serial number, revision, and part number. And then the bottom here, I, I could have multiple trendable types that I'm linking to. I could have various different fields that are linking to different trendable types. But for this example, I'm just going to have this one. Give it a nice description. Go ahead and save it. In this linked trendable type, if we double click or edit it, it'll allow us the options of this aircraft part configuration is connected to the trendable type of serialized component. It asks, what would you like to happen if the serialized component is deleted? Would you still like to keep the aircraft part configuration trendable? I could say, if the serial number is deleted, then delete the, the child as well, which is the aircraft. I can delete it or keep it, depending on if the parent is deleted. Another option in trendable types that can be really helpful is the different custom buttons. What is standard in the buttons is new trendable type or duplicate trendable. And we're going to need to create some data in here anyway, so let's start with the serialized component first. Okay, so these buttons down here, the standard is to create a new trendable or to duplicate. I'm going to select a part number. It'll be rev B. We'll give it a serial number. Select one of these technical orders. Give it a measured length. And then if I hit duplicate, it reminds me, hey, it's going to save all of these changes if you, if you don't save it. So if I save it first, then I duplicate. What it's done is it's created the exact same part number with the exact same serial number. So I'm going to come in here and create a new serial number. There we go. So if I'm doing a bunch of part numbers with a list of serial numbers, I can quickly, you know, maybe I'm doing two or three, I can quickly and easily just duplicate this, save it, duplicate it again, or I could hit new, and it'll bring me to which new trendable type would I like to create. So, but I can customize these buttons to be whatever I want them to be. This new button brought me to a new uh, trendable type of any type. So it says, hey, you hit new, what new trendable would you like to create? Would you like to create a new track, a new dent? Would you like to create a new serialized component? What would you like to create? 
So if we go back into the trendable type configuration, we open up one of our trendable types and we click on the button tab. If we click use custom buttons, and we add a specific custom button, it'll give us some options. First of all, it's going to give us a label. So uh, remember the default is new and duplicate, right? But we could create a button that's specifically labeled, create a new crack or create a new serialized component. And we can either choose to copy everything or don't copy anything from the previous trendable type. Um, we want to keep the same asset and then we can restrict the creatable types. We can say, this button is specifically for, let me shorten this a little bit so the button name isn't humongous. And we can say, instead of allowing the user the option to create anything, when they click this button, just create a new serial, serialized component. And then anytime I use custom buttons, you need to be aware that it's going to only have the buttons that you have in here. So that new and duplicate are going to be replaced. So if you want to keep a duplicate button, you'll need to add that into these custom buttons. So I want to copy everything, call it a duplicate, and restrict the creatable types to, the, we are in the aircraft part configuration. So select that, hit OK. So now we have create a new serialized component and duplicate the current trendable, which would be the aircraft part configuration. OK, so now if I'm doing an induction and I'm recording uh, some information for the new aircraft, I'm going along, I'm filling some stuff out, and I get to serial number, um, serialized component, and I see, hey, none of these part numbers or serial numbers are what is on this aircraft. I need to make a new serial number component. So if I click this button, uh, well, first of all, it's going to warn me, hey, you didn't save anything. Are you sure you want to move forward? Now, instead of doing the air aircraft part configuration, I am now creating a new serialized component. And you can see my buttons have changed to just new and duplicate. So that's what custom buttons can get you. It can get you spe very specific actions on the actual trendable that you're creating. So if you're going along and you're creating um, some findings or some discrepancies, you can create custom buttons down here that just say, you know, new. Uh, you can rename it instead of just a new trendable type. You can name it new uh, defect, and you can restrict it to just the defect trendable types. You can do like I did and say, hey, when you're tracking information about the aircraft part configuration and you don't find a specific serial number, you can hit this button and create a new serial number just on the fly here. So, Any questions about uh, custom buttons? or linking trendable types. Some other um, features that I wanted to alert you about were, grab the screen again here. Some other features are the rules and notifications as you're setting up your trendable types. So we talked about the custom buttons that we created. You can also set up notification rules. So let's say you want to be notified every time a new piece of FOD is found. You can set up an email alert for the creation uh, of any new FOD trendable or upon you know deletion or update. There are also photo naming rules. So 
let's say you're attaching photos to a specific trendable type, you can set up a type of a rule that names the photos that are attached to this trendable a very specific way. You can set up custom IDs as well. So let's say instead of using the inline ID, let's say you want to you know number these things in a very specific way. You can check this box and then add in a specific rule for that. And uh, behavior, the behaviors tab allows you to, if you set up some named regions, to be able to input um, the regions as your XYZ location. So because the aircraft part configuration does not have an XYZ field, let me go ahead and add one just for kicks so I can show you. I can then set the different fields that I have set up to be a specific region name or a specific model name. So if I've named my specific regions, then I can input those region names into a specific field into my part number. So it has to be um, a list or the name to be set into there. So it doesn't make any sense right now to put um, a region name into the tail number, uh, but if I set up a specific field to be a region name, then I could do that here. I could set that up here. And then um, the security classes, job operations, uh, and behave and some of these behaviors things are things I'll cover in another lesson that sets up specific trendable types to be used in, within and check. So we'll cover that in a little bit later class, but I wanted to get you used to um, setting up the link trendable types, um, the custom buttons, and some of the rules and notifications where you can set up uh, an email notification to yourself. So I can even customize the message. Pod was found on the floor. And then I can add recipients to this message. It could be a static user from the people who are logged into the system, or it could be a user who has been input. You know, let's say, you know, the boss always needs to be uh, input every time. Uh, it needs to be notified every time there's FOD. And then a specific user, let's say the, um, you know, if I set up a field of the inspector and the inspector was in there, then I could have the inspector notified as well that there was new FOD found. Here we go. So we kind of walked through uh, some real life examples of how to set up a custom list, a custom field, trendable type for the aircraft part configuration as well as, well as a serialized uh, component. I kind of showed that at the beginning, I highly recommend just kind of listing out the different fields you're going to need. So you can have a list of, of what you need to create in your custom lists and custom fields. Because if you come here and you create your trendable type first and say, you know, I'd like this new trendable type, and then you go to your fields, nothing's going to be in the fields yet if you haven't created them. So I like to kind of draw out or kind of map out uh, just kind of the basic structure of what I'm going to need first and then create it inside inline. Starting with the custom lists, then the custom fields, then the trendable type configuration. And whoever is the parent trendable type, I need to create them first. And then once I create the child that has the links, then I can add the links from, uh, from the parent into the child. And I can see that in this column here, these are uh, my linked fields. 
my serial number, the revision, and the part number. And these arrows here can adjust the order in which they appear. So uh, for each asset that you have, do you have to assign the trainable to it? Or it, it, as long as you create a trainable, you can give any asset related to that trainable? Yes, so trendable types are asset independent. You can create a crack on any asset unless you set up the security settings such that uh, it's different. We'll go over security settings in another class, but trendable types are asset independent. You can create any trendable type on any asset unless there's some type of security that restricts that. Now, once you've created an actual record, once you've created an actual record, once you've filled out some of that information, that information lives on the actual asset. So the blank form is asset independent. The filled out form is tied to a specific asset. 